<clears throat> this is Susan Beal, veterinarian, Jeff Maddox from the Fertrell Company. Today we're going to talk about antibiotics effects and antimicrobial alternatives. So one of the things that we wanted to do when, when we were putting this presentation together was get a little bit of a sense of who's in the audience. Because my thought was we could have everything from uh, farmers and people working on the land who want to know, you know, what do I use instead of all the way across the uh, non-exclusionary, you know, continuum of people who are interested in policy work and, and stuff on the more general state. So if we have a little bit of a sense of, of where the interests of you guys lie, um, it, it could help open or, and, and feed a little bit of our discussion in the latter part of the presentation. So, so if, if, are folks more interested in general larger policy stuff, or are they more interested in specifically what do I do instead of? <coughs> what do I do instead of? Okay. okay. So you're going to have to. You're going to have to. We're going to. We're going to talk about a little bit of stuff at, at the at initially that will just sort of help put this in a little bit of overall perspective. Um, then I'd like to go through and talk about some of the stuff that's happening on the science end of things um, that, that are gathering up some information that's statistical or not. It might be good cocktail party conversation or, again, just putting things into perspective. And then let's take it down, if it makes sense with everybody here, let's take it down more to the level of the land and, and on the farm. Does that, that sounds reasonable to everybody? So when we look at what's happening with, with drugs in general, and we look at some of the studies that are, that are coming out and have come out in recent years, it's, you're finding that we're finding all sorts of residual um, drugs and medicaments in drinking water, in water in the, pesticide, or in the Chesapeake and our watersheds. And we're seeing that those medicines are having a variety of effects. Um, when you look at the, the, the drinking water supplies for over 40 million people in this country, they're drinking water that's being contaminated with pharmaceutical stuff. When we look at the statistics from the Chesapeake Bay, for example, I sit on a working group that talks about uh, pesticides in the Chesapeake watershed. That, that's a working group made out of uh, mostly industry, not industry, but educational industry people um, and, and some, some researchers and physicians and healthcare people. And, and what, what they're really being aware is, oh my gosh, there's all this stuff. They're, they started talking about agricultural runoff, but they're also realizing that we're also getting not just pesticide runoff, but we're also getting um, pharmacochemical runoff. They're also realizing that a lot of the agrochemicals that are in the watershed um, and in our water supplies have have uh, hormonal effects, and that was great news to this group. Uh, the veterinary community has known about it probably for 20 years. Uh, the human medical community is quite amazed that atrazine has hormonal effects on, on humans and otherwise. So this is a big, big deal even for those of us who choose not to use these chemicals in our, in our day-to-day stuff. When we look at antibiotic use in the United States, 80% of the antibiotics made in this country are used in animals which is amazing. My clinical background, uh, I had a veterinary practice for over 25 years. I didn't use antibiotics in the practice, so there's somebody else out there using a heck of a lot of them. Most of those antibiotics that are used in animals are used in food-producing animals, and they're used at sub-therapeutic levels. And when we look at the statistics that came out of the FDA two years ago, 29 million pounds of antibiotics in this country per year are used in confined animal feeding operations. They're used in subtherapeutic levels. So they're either used as growth promotants or preventive medicines for things, or they're used in some situations to, to compensate for feeding practices. So when I'm putting this together and I'm writing this stuff for Kristen, I can't even figure out, I can never remember it's 29 million pounds or 29 million tons because it just seems like a whole lot. So I started figuring out what's 29 million pounds of something really look like. And I did the math. And in Pennsylvania, if you're running a triaxle legally, we could have over 605 triaxle dump trucks full of, of that amount of freight. And if you put those things in a line, nose to tail, they'd be three and a half miles worth of triaxles back to, to, to front. So for me, who 29 million pounds just seems like a huge amount, particularly when you think about how much does an antibiotic look like in a tablet form, um, you know, that, that's, a, that's a big pile of stuff. I understand dump truck loads. If, if we look at... Um, if we look at this thing that won't go backwards, um, if we look at the 
sales and distribution data. This is, uh, this is FDA numbers in this country. Uh, these are in kilograms, so not to confuse things, but you can just about double everything in that right-hand column because 2.2 kilos to the pound. We're looking at drugs that are used in food-producing animals in this country. These are 2009 sales and distribution data by that sort of stuff. And you start looking at the huge volumes of stuff. NIR um, is not individually reported. Those are drugs that are um, made by companies that either don't make enough of them to get into e any of these reporting categories or they're drugs that are sort of more orphanish drugs that don't fit under any of those categories. So it's, it's kind of like the miscellaneous bucket. That's the same thing when we start looking at not reported for export. One of the things that we... Yes? What exactly is it? An ionophore is something that is fed to livestock, uh, generally uh, young developing bovines, and in the presence of, in that digestive tract, it stimulates a, an artificially enlarged appetite. And it also maintains, it kills off or may, keeps coccidiosis and other pathogens under control at the same time. And they see a feed efficiency boost and a growth performance boost during a specific stage of growth, and that's what an ionophore is. But it's basically an artificial appetite stimulant, <clears throat> which is what they're doing. It can't be an antibiotic. It can't, yeah, that's what I was just going to say. But it's it, not tracked like an antibiotic. Yeah, it, it, it kind of falls through the cracks because now it's a feed ingredient. So Well, the, and that's the way they get around that stuff, too, is instead of saying this is an antibiotic to treat this, we're saying, well, this is an appetite enhancer or a feed like stimulant. No, no, an ionophore is, is your rumensin, rumensin, your monensin, those monensin, kinds of yeah. things. Yeah. So the other thing that's really interesting when you look at what happened in monensin and rumensin uh, as far as what can we use those particular medications for, uh, they were typically used commonly as coccidiostats. And, and then the logical line of thinking says, okay, they're licensed initially as a coccidiostat. It doesn't kill them, it just woes them. But geez, you know, Look at that. They're eating better, and they're doing better. That much be because the coxy is, is not there. Um, and so then they sort of morphed over into appetite-stimulant kinds of things. But the thing that happened in the dairy industry is that we, they also opened it to feed, uh, again, what they say they feed it for, and what happens, it, it happens to it, it, uh, cows that are acidotic, it, it really kind of settles their bellies, bellies down and stimulates them to eat even when they're feeling nauseous and they don't want to. So that's, again, you know, we can do the math. It's just buckets and buckets and buckets and buckets of stuff. And again, these animals are not being fed with clinical diagnosis of, of, of disease. These are being fed either to compensate for management issues or, or to, to as stimulants and growth promotants. <clears throat> They're used across the board in, in all sorts of, um, in all sorts of uh, industries. I'm not aware of a commercial class of animals that is not raised, um, that is not raised without some sort of antibiotic. One of the things that you've got to look at, too, with some of the new regulations that came through, and everybody's really proud of, we took these antibiotics off the market. They took some of the stuff that you've got to look at whether they take it off the market for uh, use as in subtherapeutic doses, or did they take it off the market that we can't use it in therapeutic doses? And some of the recent uh, stuff with some of the sulfos and tetracyclines uh, were, were really interesting when, when you read, uh, read the fine print. So the implications of this are huge. The implications are, are big for um, people generally. Uh, the implications are big for people who have specific allergies or reactions to some of these uh, some of these pharmaceutical agents, and there's been very interesting reports of people who eat meat that have been uh, have levels of, of certain things to which they might be allergic or sensitive, and they have everything from anaphylactic type reactions to blood dyscrasias and that sort of stuff. The other thing that's happening is it's it's very similar to the things that we see happening in um, in um, parasite control. One of the best ways to make an organism that tolerates a certain particular thing, uh, whether it be a wormer or an antibiotic or, uh, or even something in the environment, is to grow them in the environment with a small amount of that. So there's argument and debate that says if you know, two cups of this is going to kill something 
at, at a therapeutic dose, but I feed it at an eighth of a cup as a subtherapeutic dose, what we're really doing is setting up a system where, <clears throat> where one of two things happen. We either foster a group of, of bacteria that are actually learned to grow in the presence of that particular medication, or if it's or we do something that kills all of the bacteria that are sensitive to that medication, and the only ones that are left are the ones that are resistant or would grow in the presence of that medication. So we start looking at those kinds of things, and that starts making very interesting implications for people who work in a healthcare industry that chooses to use antibiotics as a, as a range of treatment, because now we're finding more and more and more things that we have to get weirder and weirder and weirder antibiotics for because the bacteria that, we're, that, that are growing are resistant to the stuff that's out there. That's a big enough issue in the human healthcare system. It's a really big issue when we start looking in the veterinary industry when, when we're starting to look for um, drugs that are actually licensed for certain species because there's certain species that are species of such minor importance that nobody wants to do the official research to either license or develop medications for use in those species. It's a huge, it's a huge issue on the human side because people are just galloping as fast as they can to try and keep up with this stuff. Um, one of the things that we see a lot, a lot of, and it's a particularly... Uh, of a particularly um, topical thing is talking about methicillin-resistant staph aureus. And, and that's a staph aureus, which is a common, common skin bacteria. I guarantee if I cultured every single person in this room, every one of you would grow some sort of staph aureus unless you've just marinated yourself in, in, in something before you walked in the door. It's a really common skin bacteria. Um, it's a common uh, hospital-borne infection. It's, a common, it's, it's just common because the stuff's out there all the time. And so if you're compromised, you're going to grow it. One of the things that we see is um, looking at methicillin-resistant staph aureus. And um, it's, it's a, it's a, it can be a really huge problem. There was some really nice work that came out of Iowa uh, talking about the Midwestern United States uh, swine workers and how, how many hogs and how many people who work with hogs actually have these bacteria um, in their system. So they, this was an interesting study. There's been a lot of work done with this in Canada, um, and we started seeing uh, methicillin-resistant staph aureus in Canada and, and in Europe, um, and we're seeing it increasingly here in the States. So this was, a, this was a study that was done over quite a bit of time. It's actually quite a meaty paper for people who are, are interested in it. I'm going to hit the high spots. These are two different hog farms. Um, they represent 87,000 live animals on these farms. They sampled up the nose hole and then back in the pharynx um, 299 swine, and they sampled 20 workers on these farms. And they found that generally... Uh, just about half of the hogs on the farms were positive for methicillin-resistant staph aureus of that particular strain, that 398 strain, which we know is a hog strain. That's where it starts. Um, and, and 45% of the workers um, uh, that were sampled were, were positive. They did not do testing where they did antibody testing. This was actually trying to get uh, DNA culture, like bacterial DNA back. They didn't do antibody antibody testing to see if people had been exposed and had an immune response to it. These were actually culturing bacteria. The thing that was really interesting about the study was that the carrier state depended on the age of the hogs and also the production system of the farm. So when we, when we differentiate the two farms, we start saying, well, farm A, 30%, 36% of their adult hogs were uh, methicillin-resistant staph aureus positive. And 100% of their six-week-old piglets and their 12-week-old piglets were positive. So that says that somewhere in that time range, those animals were, were able to mount some sort of immune response or their other normal flora in there took over or whatever, and, and that particular species of bug so, sort of sat down. We also found that 64% of the workers on that particular farm were positive. Interestingly enough, what they found on that farm was workers who did not handle hogs or didn't handle hog blood or didn't, like they're doing blood testing, bleeding hogs for a bunch of different reasons and stuff. The workers who did not do that but were in the office working office jobs or less animal handling jobs, those guys were more likely to be positive than the people who were out there working hogs, which was kind of interesting. And, and I don't have a reason for that, and they uh, they don't have a real reason for that in the paper, but it's worth looking at. What do they suspect? It, pardon me? What do they suspect happened? 
They don't know. My sense is, and, and I see it in other situations, I, I, my, my suspicion is that if you're working hogs every day and you're sort of exposed to those kind of bacteria and that sort of stuff, that you've got a more functional, potentially more functional immune response and, and your, your, you know, your other flora, same as, same as what happened in these 6- and 12-week-old piglets as opposed to you know, the difference, differentiates with the adults. That's my clinical suspicion of what happened. I can't tell you that for sure that that's what happened. Interestingly enough, on the, the other farm, there weren't any isolates at all in any of the hogs or any of the workers. So when we start looking at the variables in here, both of those farms use similar th- subtherapeutic doses of antibiotics. Their therapeutic antibiotic program, if something got sick, was, was basically the same. Um, <clears throat> farm A was an older farm, was more established. They had twice the number of hogs, but more significantly, I think, and again, we don't know what this means yet because we're still working on it, we as, as a group, uh, with the different breeds of animals from different sources of animals. And so in that first, uh, they were not specific about the breeds on this farm. On that first farm, they had some hogs that <clears throat> were tended to have imports from Canada. The second farm had sort of all locally bred animals from a relatively smaller source. So we could be looking at some breed sensitivities, um, management, you know, they kind of reduce the chances of management issues, changing stuff, and also kind of looking at what's on in the soup. Interestingly enough, um, we're finding just about 5% now of veterinarians and veterinary students who are working, veterinarians who are out working in mixed practice uh, that includes hogs, veterinary students generally across the board at school, about 5% of them were, were getting methicillin resistant staph aureus out of them. Population estimates are between 1 and 1.5. One and the, the 1% uh, are numbers from the mid-90s, mid, the mid 90s, uh, or mid-2000s, mid like 2002, 2004, 2005, that 1.5 half is more 2010 numbers. Uh, interestingly, in, in the Netherlands, uh, that swine strain that we know originates in hogs is, is 20% of all the methicillin resistant staph aureus that we're seeing in, in humans detected comes from that particular strain. So now there's a paper here. The ink isn't even dry on this stuff. This came out of Iowa and Minnesota, published the end of last month. And, and this is the largest study of looking at this particular organism in conventional and alternative retail pork products. Now, what they're calling alternative retail pork products are, are, is pork that's labeled antibiotic-free or grown without subtherapeutic antibiotics. That's, that was their study. So they did 395 samples of, of meat in uh, 36 stores. They did it because of where the researchers were. They did Iowa, Minnesota, and New Jersey. And just, these numbers are interesting, and just don't obsess on them. I'm happy to get you the full paper if you want, but just listen to them. They got Staph aureus from about 65% of the samples. That was about 67% conventional pork and about 57% um, alternative pork, antibiotic-free pork. Of those isolates, 61% of the conventional pork isolates were sensitive to methicillin. So if you took that particular antibiotic, that bug lay down and died. And about 50% in the alternative pork were sensitive. So of all of those samples, 216 samples were methicillin resistant. And of those samples, about a little over 25% of them were that, that strain 398 that comes from hogs. But half of those half of the mesocillin-resistant staph aureus were actually strains that start in people and then were passed to hogs. So when they actually chase the DNA on those particular bacteria and, and, and look at what strains they were, these are not strains that are starting off in pigs. These are strains that are starting off in humans, and then we're giving them to the pigs, and then the pigs are giving them back to us. Don't point at me. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so there's there's really big there's really big um, Im- implications in this particular study. They saw a really big difference um, from the stuff that's coming out of Europe right now, because in a, in Europe we're seeing some really significant difference is in hogs that are raised conventionally and hogs that are raised alternative types of methods. Um, the, the, the paper felt that this, 
this lack of really big difference between those two classes of hogs is probably because we're cross-contaminating everything at slaughter, and, and that, that was their biggest thing. And because they just went to the store and bought meat out of the rack, um, they, you know, they didn't trace that. But when we go back to the slaughter plants, uh, that, that was the feeling. Um, the percentages were higher than anything that we've seen in the states before in the smaller studies, but they're fairly consistent to what we're seeing or have been seeing in Canada over the years. And then I'd just like to just take a step back and look not just in this, but just what's that implication of cross-contamination at slaughter and also what's that implication of cross-contamination within the species so that, you know, piggy A is getting something from piggy B um, and then you know, piggy A maybe hits, you know, snorting it on Mr. Cow or Mr. Person or Mrs. Person and, and that sort of stuff. So one of the things that we look at, and it's really fun to look at, is where things start and where they track from. And that's just something to, you know, that's something to think about. I don't even want to talk about some of the weird stuff that's happening with some of the, the, the bird flus and the swine flus and, and those kinds of ways. Now that's viral, not bacterial, but things morph around like that pretty quickly. So just pretty pictures of, of uh, scanning electron micrographs of some E. coli and stuff. So when we, this is some work that came out of, uh, I don't even know where those guys were that would have published, but they're talking about you know, the validation and the realization and why we need to use these things is because it's credited to lowering the cost of meat lowering the cost of milk, lowering the cost of eggs, and so we can all eat cheap here in, in this country. And, and my challenge to you is to, is to take back and, and you know, wonder if what's that worth. They also say uh, uh, that the practice, obviously you can read it as well as I can, but when we start looking at you know, just what we said earlier, that whole reservoir of, of, of bacteria that is actually resistant to many antimicrobial agents, not just antibiotics, but other things that we're using to kill bugs. And go. So we want to take a look at, we want to answer the question, why do we even use the antibiotics or the antimicrobials to begin with? And generally it stems from, you know, these products are often used because of a result of a weakened or suppressed immune system, and following that, with it, either that or following a traumatic stress condition to the animal, anytime that you change its environment rapidly and you haven't prepared it for that change, to either eating, <coughs> drinking, resting behavior, Anything that you change in that animal's world is a stress, okay? And if you're not ready to respond to that stress or meet the need prior to that stress, these are when the immune system is dropped or the animal goes off feed or, you know, all of the above. So a weakened immune system is often attributed to those environmental-related conditions such as air quality, water quality, and feed quality. Now, I did not get those three <coughs> topics out of order. Those are exactly the priority to the animal as I have listed them there, okay? If you don't have good air quality, everything else you're doing doesn't matter. If you don't have good water quality, it doesn't matter. You can talk to me all day long, every day, about fixing feed, and I cannot make a difference. For, for every, <coughs> every pound of dry matter, and, and this is across species, uh, agricultural species, for every pound of dry matter, your animals eat, they eat three pounds of water. So you got all these people who are all worried and worried and worried about feed, 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 and the biggest nutrition that we see in, in animals is water, and not very many people you know, are, are looking at water testing, water quality testing, those sorts of things. A healthy producing adult bovine will consume 200 pounds of water in a day, and I typically feed her between 45 and 50 pounds of dry matter. Yeah. That's any form of moisture, whether they're getting it from pasture, actual water, drank, whatever. But her total moisture requirement on a given day, all things being what they ought to be, is about 200 pounds. Now, that's dependent. I'm talking about a 1,500-pound Holstein manufacturing 60-plus pounds milk. of milk. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. And that varies. But so does her dry matter intake. So Susan's about point about... yeah. That's a good rule of thumb to hold on to it. It's, it's going to be three to one. When you see that get out of balance, then you know that there's a health, health issue about ready to, 
jump up and bite you. Well, and even for me, the bigger part is, is a lot of people spend a lot of time and energy and money balancing rations or testing rations or doing forage testing and testing here and testing there and testing every load of feed that comes in. And, and that's all done and all done and all done. And you ask them about their water and they don't know anything about it or they know that it's got coliforms in it or they know that it's got too much sulfur in it or too much this in it or it's crappy or whatever. And, and so it's really one of the big, the big, big, big nutrient things. What would you test for in the water quality? Bacteria, <coughs> nitrates, heavy uh, hardness, minerals that are dissolved. First off, you know, you start with your nitrates and your bacteria. Yeah, part of it depends a little <coughs> on your, yeah. And then you'll, talk, you'll always look at, you know, hardness and pH. That's pretty much a basic water test. If you see something that sets up a red flag, then continue the testing and go deeper in there to find out. Right. And, you start, know, with, it, start with the basics. You know, if your water is neutral pH, you know, 6, 5 to 7, somewhere in there, uh, hardness isn't bad, nitrates are okay, and your, and your total coliform count comes back, you know, on the lower side, probably I wouldn't push to pursue it. I wouldn't either. Okay. The, but if, if something, one of those is askew. Or if you've got health problems, you can't explain. Yeah. And if it tastes bad to you, it's not going to taste good to them. Yeah. yeah, exactly, Linda. One of the things that we do see, I mean, it is certainly possible to, 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 to test for, for nitrates in different forms. It's certainly part possible to test for agri other agricultural chemicals. Uh, and there's a lot of folks, and it tends to be the group that I tend to work with, uh, will start testing for electrical conductivities and that, and that sort of stuff as, as well. Being able to measure your water intake based on the, the, the pounds of animal weight that you have is really a key management tool because if they're not consuming that three times their dry matter or whatever they should be consuming. If you have chickens, for instance, they'll consume twice as much water as feed every day by week. When that number is not what it should be, then you should start digging deeper because you're either losing performance or you're sacrificing health issues. And the, the thing that the, the, the game I play is, is I don't want to talk to you when you're over there hung up in the trees. You know? You're driving along the road, and you just start to get off the road. You're going to feel that little bump you know, with the fog line. And if you keep going off the road, you're going to feel the gravel, and then maybe you're going to get some grass, but you don't have to be way over there before you think, oh, my God, I'm not in the road anymore. And one of the first things you'll start seeing is a change in water consumption. You see a lot of these <clears throat> Is that affecting the consumption? It absolutely it is, does. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> absolutely. Yeah, if you have large livestock in the wintertime, if you, uh, for dairy farmers who have plate coolers, I, you know, I say, hey, warm that water up. If you get that water up at least to, say, 45, 50 degrees, <clears throat> you'll see that the consumption go up It'll drastically. It'll double. Right. Yeah. All right. Same, Same goes when it's above 85 degrees, then you're going to have a decreased intake and you'll see a decreased appetite and then you'll see a decrease And you'll see them falling off the water pipe and yeah. dropping dead. <laughs> yeah. So <clears throat> from where I stand and, and the challenge is and we can take this as far or not far as you want and since it seems like we've got a group of practical people in here not academic people I think we should push it. The horns of the dilemma is it really really are this and how long does it really make sense to continue to practice animal management and food handling and all of those sorts of things in a manner that makes it okay to say, oh, well, we'll do all this and just sort of clean it up at the end? And so when we really step back and look at the dollar value of it from, from even feed costs and animal health care issue costs, but then we keep stepping back and looking at the dollar value and the ecological environmental value of what it is that we're doing by continuing to perpetuate that kind of agriculture, I really think you know, it's, it's, it's time to just step back and look. Because a lot of this is really, <clears throat> really common sense. Some of it is common sense and it comes you know, from the heart. I don't want to do this anymore. Some people are really getting forced to, you know, they don't necessarily want to make any changes, but they're getting forced from the regulatory issues to say that they either the stuff isn't available, it's not available for the, the use, the way that we u have been using to use it, and so we start looking at, you know, how the heck are we going to treat or prevent 
uh, illnesses in animals if we don't have those things available to us. So you maybe couldn't care less about why, why we're using antibiotics or, or don't want to stop or don't think it's weird or anything like that, but you're being forced by, by regulatory issues to, to do that. When I work with, I, I spend a lot, I, I work with a lot of farmers, but I also spend a lot of time working with veterinarians who are learning not to be conventional veterinarians, who are actually learning that there's different tools in their toolboxes. And one of the biggest fears that I hear from farmers who are looking at converting into some sort of an alternative system, whether it be certified organic system or whether it just be a lower uh, chemical input system, is they're really scared about what to do if something gets sick. And I talk to veterinarians who are really, you know, they'd love to, it's killing them being in conventional food animal practice. And they would love to be out of conventional food animal practice, but they are, they're scared because they don't know what to use in case something gets sick. So the first, the first thing that you use is that common sense sort of preventative stuff. We are not going to vaccinate, medicate, potion, lotion, or anything prevention, preventive health care on an animal population that is going to be more powerful and more useful than the stuff that we're going to build them from them for the ground up. And so when we start looking, and this is true of all classes of animals, you know, the dairy guys tell me you can't do it in dairy, you might be able to do it in beef, you know, the piggy guys say you can do it in pastured hogs, but you can't do it in confinement hogs, the chicken guys say, you know, I don't know what the chicken guys always say, but, but my, my challenge and my experience has been you can see this in all classes of animals and all types of agriculture. It's a continuum, but, but you, can, you can shift that. So when we start looking at, at all of these animal classes, we realize that the basics are the basics of the basics. And it's, it's common sense, most of it. <clears throat> yeah. The keys to not treat an animal are right there. Fresh air, clean water with easy access, regular exposure to direct sunlight, you know, clean, nutritious, species-appropriate foodstuffs, and a clean, dry place to rest. If we don't provide these things to ourselves, you all know what happens. I mean, we end up sick, right? As long as these basic requirements of life are met, the, the opportunity of treating is greatly reduced. I don't want to say it's nil, but it is greatly reduced. In my clinical experience and the experience of my colleagues, probably 90-plus percent, 95 percent of what I'm called to treat in production animal medicine is due to errors in management or nutrition. Once in a blue moon, you'll get something that gets out, gets hit by a skid steer or, or something like that. But, but most of the kinds of stuff, whether it's reproductive stuff, whether it's, whether it's mastitis, whether it's dystocias, whether it, you peck it, um, it's, it's, because, it's because of errors in management or husbandry. It's not because they're sick. So we get that sort of fertile soil, and then the other stuff comes in. So again, looking at clean air outside, walking around. Um, the, one of the things that we don't happen, it doesn't happen so often in animals, is we remove them from that sort of family herd kind of expectation. Um, again, all classes of animals. Having seen hogs, and I really like hogs, I can understand why folks might want to keep them on concrete too. The other thing that we look at is just sort of species-appropriate kinds of things. We, we look also at times of classes of animal production when they're most likely to get a little bit wobbly. You know, so we see, for example, and again, this is true for all species, but we'll talk maybe about cows, right in, right in around the time of late gestation and parturition. Because what happens is they actually take an immune system drop in, in at that area. And so it's, it's not necessarily that they're fragile because they're heavily pregnant, thank you, but they're, fra- they're fragile because metabolically um, and immunologically, as things change with their relationship with the fetus, and as the fetus turns into a calf that's ready to become a viable unit, they drop their immune system. They also, what happens in that last little bit of gestation, and Jeff can give you the numbers um, probably way better than I can give you the numbers, is when we start looking at that transfer of mineral um, from mama to baby. Um, so all of those animals, because, and this is normal physiology, that she's going to push selenium over to the baby, she's going to push phosphorus over the baby because they're building bones and that sort of stuff in that last little bit of gestation. And so those cattle, unless they have the ability to access appropriate nutrients at the appropriate time, everything's going into the baby bucket so that the baby will come out appropriately. And those things in and of themselves, those relative deficiencies... 
um, and functional deficiencies. It's perfectly normal physiology, but those are things that are just going to get her just a little bit, a little bit more wobbly. And if other things aren't right in that system, or if something comes along, she's going to be more predisposed to having, having issues. One of the other, one of the other things that we, you know, we talk about, and we can talk about more or less, depending on what you guys want to do, is is just basic nutrition and mineral nutrition. One of the things that I see really often in in uh, in management situations is just in around calving. You know, all of those things that happen before calving and around calving. Um, there's some really interesting programs, both in the beef and dairy industry. You know, where we talk about, oh my gosh. Should mama cows actually suck their calves, or should we take them away? When we start looking at the diseases that, that those protocols, and I can give you all those protocols, um, but when we start looking at those, the, the diseases that those protocols were set up to ostensibly prevent, and we look at, for example, the Yoni's program in this country over the last 10 years, what we're finding is we're not really making any difference in Yoni's disease at all generally on the national herd. Uh, some of those hygiene issues and pay attention to the poop issues uh, have changed a lot of things with, with transfer of, of um, E. coli's and that sort of stuff in young calves. But when we really look at what we're doing with Yoni's on a national herd level, we haven't changed it but maybe 1%. The other thing that's really interesting about Yoni's, and then I'll come back and we can talk about other antibiotics and stuff, Yoni's is 100% nutritional disease. And it's very possible to, to turn Yoni's around as a group of animals when we start feeding cattle like cattle instead of feeding cattle like hogs. But one of the things that we really underestimate the importance of uh, and one of the situations where we start right right from the get-go is, you know, you go out and if you're going to buy milk replacer, you're going to buy, buy baby chicken feed, you're going to buy hog feed, um, you know, for piglets, what do you, what's the first question that people ask you? Or they don't ask you unless you know to ask. You want it medicated or you don't want it medicated. And you start looking at these little reps, and the best medicine for this calf is coming right from mama. You know, she's, she's been out there. She's been in the environment. She's been exposed to things in the environment. She's treating, she's got good antibodies that are, are for your individual farm, for your individual herd, for that individual group of hogs that lived, you know, together in that hog barn. And the best medicine is going to come right out of mama's udder. And, and, you know, and I'm not talking just colostrum. You know, yes, certainly it's antibiotic rich. Certainly the gut is open for that period of time. And that's a really important time. But I'm also talking, you know, along, along the line. And we're looking at just straight, you know, straight, straight nutrition, too. And, and, you know, there's a lot to be said for calving calves outside. There's a lot to be said for, in the beef business, shifting your gut. You don't want to be making babies in the middle of the winter. You know, let's put them up on grass. There's a lot, you know, you can talk about they, the dairy. I can, I can give you arguments, seasonal or not seasonal. But there's a lot to be said for not, not calving your cows in the gutter or in the, in the slop or in the wet. Again, out in the pasture as much as possible, getting some herd and, and just looking at, looking at those those, huh? Yeah, yeah. She's working hard. She's she's working hard um, to to look at those things. Hi, Hugh. Cabin in the spring, you know, goats and sheep have a five month gestation, and mares have eleven months. And when they are easiest to breed, they're all cabin in the spring, but not cattle. They're year round. That's the weirdest thing. Yeah. Odd if you think about it. I think the thing. I think the thing that we don't know about cattle, and I think it, as we start running more cattle in larger groups, um, that, that particularly run in larger groups with a herd bull in, as, as some, I think we're going to see cattle are going to start, start, start to shift because we're really starting to see changes in that whole dynamic when we put them into a more natural in, environment. That's something. I'll buy you tea in about 20 years. We can talk about that one because it, it is it is very curious to it is very curious to see one of the things. And I'm glad you walked in. One of the things that I, I wanted to say right in here too is in the dairy business. I think that as we increase our use of nurse cows, we're going to see some really significant immunological changes in, in these babies. Yes, it's more cost effective. Yes, it's a great thing to do with some of your cows that you might, might not well want in the milk parlor. Um, but I and 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 we were talking to folks this morning who um, 
actually left all their replacement or all their heifer calves. They left them on their milking string of cows even even during the milking. So there's a bunch of ways to do this nurse cow thing. Uh, it's good because it teaches babies how to be calves. And st- I mean, tying a string to somewhere isn't going to teach you how to be a calf. It teaches you how to eat. You know, you talk about herd herd dynamics. They get to hang out together and and you know with with whoever happens to be on babysitting duty. Um, their moms can teach them how to eat different kinds of forages. But immunologically, those animals are 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 exposed to again sort of the bacteria and the other kinds of things in the herd and also the antibodies from those those cattle. Hugh and I were at a meeting a couple of weeks ago, and one of the things that I asked him, and I don't think we have this as, as an answer in the industry, and I think it's something we need to start looking at as more dairy producers are 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 looking at ganging up um, their calves on some nurse cows that have been removed from the milking string because of some chronic mastitis issues. I believe, I don't have any data to support this yet, and and I'm going to presume Hugh's going to get it done for us, Um, but I believe what we're going to see was when those heifers come back into the milking string that grew up on those strep ag and and, and staph aureus um, positive cows that had been put out as nurse cows, I believe that we're not going to see those, the, the level of mastitis, all things otherwise being equal, we're not going to see that level of infectious mastitis in those particular replacement heifers because of that relative vaccination type issue of b- having that exposure. I don't know that to be true. I'll talk to you in five or ten years. The other thing, there's again, there's when we talk about stress and stuff, hanging out with the boys, you know, you, that's, that's not a very stressed group of calves. They're just happier too. Yeah. <clears throat> and and mom's gonna be mom's gonna be uh, mom's gonna be happier too. And and that, that's gonna reduce the need for stuff with her. Again, when we're looking at dryness, bedding, places to places to um, places to hang out. One of the things we talk about, do you guys know this plant? Echinacea. I stuck her in there just because she's one of the plants that uh, that is a good, you know, for the what to use instead of kind of of things. There's great studies. Uh, there's several species of echinacea. Most of the time we use a root. Uh, we start looking at uh, purpura as one of the ones that we commonly use. Um, uh, there's some really great studies with uh, um, how quickly, you know, within 20 minutes of, of uh, taking echinacea, you're going to see your white councils start to start to double and fevers start to be re- reduced and stuff. It's a it's a tremendously powerful uh, powerful herbal body to keep <clears throat> keep there. The other thing that's really interesting about it is it's really useful. It's not very useful actually to use it all the time because it keeps your immune system at such a stimulation point that it actually starts getting tired. So it's a, but it's a really great herb to use sort of either as a tonic herb periodically or, or when you need to have the big dogs. So. I'm typically talking about the roots in, in this particular plant, Linda. The other, you know, again, like you said, just keeping everybody happy. Uh, some, of the, some of the more appropriate nutrition in, in these animals. The other thing that we just you know have to also think about, and it's, it was on Jeff's well Jeff's list, which is our list, kind of lower, but but just general handling and housing stress. You know, if you're living in a barn with stray voltage, if you're living in a barn that's too cold, too damp, too whatever, if you're living in uh, if you're living in um, if you're living in mud, your energy requirement goes up sixty percent if 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 they're in mud. It's just phenomenal. Um, and, and then just all of that sort of stuff, you know, in for milking, how you move them, how you move them through your parlor, how you handle your, your small room in stock, your, you know, how you move your chicken tractors every day, those, those kinds of things. It, it, it really just it grinds you down. You know, if you can think of living in your house where if the temperature is like 45 degrees all the time, you know, you can do it, but it just gets old. This is one of the slides I contributed. This is a study done by Diane Shiv- Shivera up in uh, Maine. She actually took the oregano product, which is an oregano oil that's dispersed with calcium carbonate and diatomaceous earth. It derives from the oregano vulgare. Now, this is a specific hybrid that this company has grown for them in Greece. And they import it at its harvest just like we would alfalfa at a particular stage of maturity where the oil is at the highest concentrations. Um, The oil is... (sighs) changes the permeability of the bacteria cell and the membrane cation, such as the H and the K. The oil works the same mechanism as an ionophore that we talked about earlier. 
Um, it's a widely used, such as a widely used coccidiostatin and et cetera. It's, but it's a natural product, like I said. It's a completely, it's a pressed oil out of a natural plant. The plant hasn't been genetically modified. It's not grown with some magic foo-foo dust fertilizer. It just, it actually, they found out it grows <laughs> wild in Greece. And there's a lot of oil coming into the country that is wild harvest. But it's not harvest, it's harvested at many different stages of development. So some people go pick it young and some people go pick it old. It depends on when they can get on the mountains and pick it. Uh, the companies that are using it continually, uh, such as Rauco and the Regano product line, they are, it is being farmed for them. They have over 200 acres of, of oregano being farmed for this purpose only. A slide that'll show you what the zone inhibition or the, the bacteria control on these particular bacteria. Do you guys know how they do that? That when we talk about zone of inhibition, what they'll do is they'll take a bacteria and they'll make a culture of it and they put it out on a plate, a petri dish plate full of sort of something that looks like jello that's a nutritional stuff. They put the bacteria so it all that it is all spread on the top and there's a little there's a little thing that'll dispense a disc like a little blotting paper disc. Um, around on this little petri dish and that disc contains the substance that we want to test whether it's an antibiotic or whether it's the five percent oregano oil or whatever and you just literally it sets on top of, and the little disc floats sits on top of the jello and then if if the if the antibiotic or substance inhibits growth what you'll see is a lawn of of the bacteria will grow but there'll be a space around that little disc and we actually just measure how, what's the diameter of that space to talk about zones of inhibitions. So I'm just curious, with essential oils that don't cross into the blood agar, do they use a water-based oligonotrate or something like that? Uh, yeah, they, they also have a water-based available. Uh, the oil-based, which is a dry carrier to go into the feed system, you can, you can put it into the water system. Um, and it can also be used on an as-needed basis. So cow with mastitis or something along those lines, you can actually use it topically. Some farmers are going off label and actually injecting it into the bloodstream. I don't recommend that. There's, there's too much in the unknown there, but large conventional farmers that can no longer combat intramammary or topically are using it in their own fashion. It is not condoned by the company in any way, but, but it is a contact <coughs> Product. It's a contact killer. These are the bacteria that they tested. And the next slide will show you the, the same thing. Um, the bacteria that they've tested, now here's a comparison where they actually took commonly used antibiotics, over the counter type things, you know, today tubes and uh, what all they streptomycin, penicillin, you know, the whole list is in your handout. And what the yellow, which is the highest bar on this graph, is 8% oregano oil compared, it's another zone inhibition test. And the 8% the oregano oil actually outperformed all of these typically used antibiotics. Now you apply, is it topical, is it in the carrier, or you apply it topically? <coughs> it can be internally, it can be topically, it can be, yeah. You can, you can distribute it in you feed. You can distribute it in the feed, which is the best way for swine and poultry, okay. yeah, during the, certain stages of growth. Now that's the oregano oil. The yeah. thing about it, you gotta you gotta realize, is it's burning. So so <clears throat> that don't, yeah, don't play with this stuff straight. You don't want you don't <clears throat> really want to touch anything over ten percent. You'll know that you've touched it. And and that's one of the things that you have to consider when you're using it. For example, if you if you're using it intramammary, um, you don't want to run a pure oregano oil up a teat canal because it's just gonna a your eyes are gonna go like this when you do it, and b you're actually gonna get just some because it's it's caustic is almost the word I want to use. So it you want to always put it in some sort of a carrier. Right. It is caustic, yeah. and, and they It'll and burn. they water it down with oregano yeah. or with olive oil. With olive oil, typically here. Yeah. Absolutely. It is. That I would agree. Absolutely. Yes, I absolutely would agree. Yeah, question. The 
Uttershall started out at at 10%, and then they took it down to 8%, and now they're down to 7%. Okay. Is that as de- that's the ingredient though? That's not as delivered, right? As delivered. As delivered. No, no, no. Yep. The the only <coughs> product that us any of us in this room can get from Uttersol or Ralco is seven yeah. percent. Okay. And if you if you've <clears> used <throat> Uttersol, you know. I mean, you know, you've put it on your hands. You're yeah. talking about the Utter Joy. Utter Joy. Sorry. I gave her a dab of Utter Joy one day, and she <coughs> thought it was phenomenal. <laughs> is that the that the basil? The Utter Joy has tea tree and oregano, and it has a carrier. It's a cream. It's a rub-on cream. It really is phenomenal. You had a question in the corner, and then Ben? Yeah, I just wondered about the Utter Joy. You wouldn't put that in the gym. People are doing that. I don't recommend I would, that. Yeah. I don't <laughs> recommend that. Um, you know, like I said, there are farmers that are going off label. They're really, it's dangerous. Well, what do you do for hard quarters and that's there's more to I mean you can ask us hard quarters and, and Hugh can say one thing and Susan will say something and, and I'm going to ask you your, <laughs> what's, ask you what's, what's, the living, what's she betting on um, what's her living condition what are you feeding her so I don't know if it's starch related I don't know if it's a mineral imbalance I don't know if she's living in mud so all, there's so many things that could cause it you know there's high body can because yeah. of where the starch releases in the digestive tract. So I never exceed four pounds of barley, ever, really? ever. To a full-size bovine who's producing high volumes, I would never feed more than four pounds of barley a day to a bovine. Absolutely not. Any of the small grains, I pretty much limit at four pounds or less. And you're, you're, you're at that danger zone at four pounds. Sorry. <laughs> so, there's, you know, when, when you ask about a health thing, they're, they're, we're always going to ask a lot of questions because we have to narrow it down, you know. And, and I don't want to just say, well, rub butter soil on it's going to fix it. Well, it might, but it didn't fix the problem. Yeah, and it didn't fix why, why she had it in the first place. This is the list of the uh, antibiotics that were used in that previous test in a clear, so you can see they were all on that graph. I didn't put it in here, but the active ingredient in the oregano, what they found is carvacol and thiamol, which are actually two antimicrobial components which are identical to what is put in your synthetic Listerine if you were to use Listerine. It's the exact same except for the synthetic that they use in mouthwashes is a synthetic, and it's a carcinogen, whereas the natural form has not been shown to show any carcinogenic effect. But I think, I think Hugh's point is really well taken, and it's one that, that I would, would, I mean, I'll make when we talk about garlic in a little bit here, but we get this effect when we use herbs in, in their totality. And it's one stuff, I mean, Jeff and I jack on each other about this all the time, you know, about using something the way it grows and, and comes together to grow rather than isolating each little tiny little bit out of it. And, and what we found is when we take herbal preparations and start to isolate stuff and only use this component and all that other stuff, you know, I don't know what it does, but it, it isn't the active thing. And we start to separate them, the, actually the, the synergistic power of using that particular plant is often lessened. So we see that with one particular plant, and then we also see it uh, typically um, in the, in the people who, you know, who I learned a lot from, a lot of times we had the, you know, the primary plant and then we had a helper herb or something, something like that. So we can't, we really can't, and, and this is one of the dangers that I find of getting into the room and saying, well, what's the alternative, you know, what do I use instead of? It's way more than just the chemistry and the active ingredient stuff. It's, it, you have to just try and get your head out of that way of thinking and just shuffle around on the room and say, hey, wait a 
argument. You know, we're not trying to sterilize the world anymore. I mean, you know, when we start looking and saying, well, I don't have a tolerance for bacteria, and I don't have a tolerance for fungi, and I don't have a tolerance for viruses, and I don't have a tolerance for fleas, and I don't have a tolerance for ticks, and I don't have a tolerance for this. I mean, where does it where does it stop? And we start looking and thinking, hey, wait, we're, we're in a living, active community of organisms, <clears throat> large and small. We can't just start deciding on our stupid human brain that this one is necessarily bad. So it's not usually presence or absence of, it's relative balance of. There would, there would be no way for them to compare to, <clears throat> to iodine or betadine. Because those are I mean, way off label too. I mean, it's, there's yeah, no cl- recommendation. To but do clinically, that, so. you could do it. I mean, clinically, you could make some udders and shove those things up there and look at the counts and look at the histology and maybe decide you're going to sacrifice a cow and do all that sort of stuff. But yeah. But whenever, and I came back to this because to go along with what Susan and Hugh are saying, no matter which one of these components you used, whether you reached for the antibiotic to fix a problem or you chose to use the oregano oil you're going to create a void in the metabolism or the, in that ecosystem within the animal that you're treating. So if I use a single ingredient, which is wrong, I'm learning that that's a wrong way to go, but I always am, because I'm a nutritional person, I'm boosting the nutrition to a super high level so that when I take that support away, the animal can close the gap on her own. Okay? And I might be wrong in that thinking, but it, at least I'm doing something because if you don't fill that void, Generally, something harmful will fill. Well, that's the, the point, exactly, Jeff. You know, and you can say, "Well, this is really great. Look at how tall those big yeah. yellow bars are." But there's nothing in that oregano oil that has changed anything about the management of that animal. So go back to all those pretty pictures of nice cows and cute calves and all of that sort of stuff. You know, the, 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 these guys. I mean, your cow that's got some clinical disease that you're treating doesn't have an oregano oil deficiency. We're using that as a, as a crutch or tool, but it still doesn't mean we, we can't correct the why is it there in the first place. Not that I promote milk replace or anything, but this slide is significant in that it's showing okay. us that using things like the essential oils does not destroy the natural microflora of the calf's digestive tract. In other words, if, if it was, we would not be exceeding the no additive columns here as far as intake and, and body weight gain. Garlic, we're going to spend a good bit of time, I'm sure, on garlic. Garlic is one of my favorite, you know, when I see somebody who has a mild infection of some sort or something out of balance. Um, Researchers feel that there's two main ingredients in there, the allicin and the, I can't pronounce it, so Susan? Dialyl sulfates. You know, uh, it it also contains a lot of other stuff, proteins, fibers, potassium, phosphorus, et cetera. but they really feel that the key is probably the allicin. Do you, Hugh, is that? Are you sleeping? No. Al- okay. <laughs> okay, garlic. Allicin is probably the key ingredient. Yeah, but you got to use it fresh crushed. Yeah, that's, the the ends, that's what I was just going to say. And, and, that, and that's the point later on, too. Depending on what you want to do with your garlic, uh, the preparation makes, makes a difference. Yeah. When we look at some of the studies that, that they've done, um, and, and I have citations for these for those of you who might be interested, have, have looked at uh, the antimicrobial activity of garlic, and we're seeing both the gram-positive and, and the gram-negative. So, so the staph aureus is in the E. coli's and the salmonellas and, and all of those guys. Um, actually, garlic has good, um, has good antimicrobial activities. We also find, interestingly enough, that viruses, fungi, and parasites, there's some really lovely um, study, there's really good, nice work with viruses being done, and we're seeing really uh, some really good antiparasiticide or anti-parasitic effects, uh, particularly, we'll see it with coxie, but we'll also see it with tapeworms as, as well in, in all species. And, uh, and we, we have a really long history um, um, you know, just in, in common sense lore, uh, using garlic either internally or topically uh, to treat a lot of different kinds of, of, of infections, uh, respiratory, dermatologic, um, uh, digestive stuff. Um, there's some really good, if you're, if you're looking at the old women's uh, healing literature, you know, talking about some of the reproductive tract infections and, and those sorts of things, both infections and, uh, and tumors and stuff. 
have actually treated with topical application of, of garlic as a as a pessiary and, and those kinds of things. Um, you know, I could argue the few good clinical studies. I find in the literature that I look at, there's really good clinical studies. If you want a double applied placebo tested, you know, thing that was done since nineteen or since two thousand and six, probably not as many. Uh, have, have found that it's good for dermatological infections, mm-hmm. which I don't run too, too much in the cows. But, um, uh, yeah, think any species. High-stress family pets seem to have a lot <clears throat> yeah. of, uh, of those. Would you, give me a short, if you can, a brief way, and I can tell a client to try. Just, to yeah, just, just crush, it. crush it in the thing, yeah. And we've got some dosing recommendations here in a couple slides. Yep, crush it and put it in the food, fresh garlic. And you can you can also you can also say, geez, while you're doing that, why don't you just take his commercial dog food in half and throw a little bit of meat and a little bit of veggies in with that and throw some garlic on top? <laughs> yeah. So so they're actually they're actually seeing um, in in humans the, with a clinical diagnosis of HIV AIDS, we're actually seeing that we're seeing an increase in the natural killer cell activity. Natural killer cells are one of the white cell families that has specific antiviral activity, and so they're they're getting good you know good measurement with that. We're also seeing some really clear. Now, some of this is from the veterinary literature, but but it's also extrapolatable, uh, and we also have human side stuff that goes back. But a lot of times. The veterinarians publish before the human guys do. So there's some old articles in the Association of the Veterinary Medical Association, which is the conventional journal. It's not like the, the unconventional guys, um, but they're looking at uh, lowering blood co- cholesterol and triglycerides uh, with the use of garlic. And so we do see in some breeds of dogs that get a really high lipid level in their blood, same as humans do. Um, that we're seeing that we're seeing that the garlic will take that down, and it's just in fairly moderate doses. I mean, it wasn't really scary. We had some great studies that came out in the late '80s talking about tumors in rats, um, and that has to do a lot not with oh my gosh, we're going to kill those bad cells, but it had to do more with the fact that it actually strengthens the liver function, and it has a blood cleansing ability, and it's got a liver strengthening ability, and when you do those kinds of things, then your liver can do its thing, and and it'll actually help filter out cells that are not supposed to be there. That happens more in the spleen than the liver, but it actually helps with highly functioning enzyme systems that help filter out toxins. What we see in environments where bodies have got exposure to a lot of toxins is we've got two enzyme systems in our liver. Well, we've got several, but but one that's a group of the stage one, and those do the first filtering uh, detoxifying bit. The toxins that are formed from that are usually way more toxic than the original toxins, and we need to kick that second level stage enzymes in uh, into functioning so that they can take that relatively more toxic byproduct and get it out the other end. And and, and garlic is one of those things that helps kick in that second layer of, of enzyme activity. So when we look at things, you know, it's back to what we said earlier in kind of a roundabout way. Instead of waiting till something happens and how do we treat it, how do we kill it, how do we out of her, let's go back on the common sense way and say how do we sort of nurture this and nourish this at the beginning so that we never get to the point of having to treat that stuff. Yeah, we're talking about some of the studies with some of the components looking at tetracycline and the allicin together. Um, <clears throat> The, and the same with this, the Jeff said with the essential oils and stuff. We're not going to see a whole lot of uh, problem with your conventional uh, with your conventional flora as as well when we're when we're doing uh, when we're doing garlic. It's not going to wipe the good guys out as well as the bad guys. Blood clots. There's some really nice work in France in horses, particularly that are having blood clots in their lungs, uh, feeding garlic in in their in with their grains, uh, talking about having that as a way to to reduce clotting. My clinical experience has been that that works well also in other species. And so when we start looking at some of the people that are taking low dose aspirin therapy uh, every day, it's potential that we could do that also as well with the fresh garlic. Uh, we see it in in cats and stuff for some other conditions where they tend to get 
clots and thrombi, where garlic will help with that. Uh, one of the things that that goes back to, and I, I know you know Hughes talked about it, Jeff talks about it, I've talked about it. Um, just that whole business of allowing animals um, to go out there and eat what they need from that sort of natural pharmacy, and so instead of having monoculture pastures or worrying that oh my gosh this is bad for them and oh. Cows don't eat garlic or they don't eat dandelions or they don't eat this. You know, if we give them an opportunity, they'll actually go and self-medicate at appropriate times in appropriate amounts. That's, that's the, other, the other thing that we see. And the, the garlic dosages, this is from, that's from the human literature, Jeff, that? Yep. Most of that? Yeah, and human literature is about four grams, one to two cloves of raw garlic per day. Um, you know, 300 milligrams dried garlic powder. Fresh is always going to be better, but you can still get the effect from dried garlic powder. <coughs> One, 1.3% allicin, 0.6% allicin yield uh, two to three times a day. I think it's way more clear in animals. <laughs> you know, so, sometimes they'll actually self-medicate. So when we're looking, um, we're looking at an eighth to a quarter of a teaspoon of, of uh fresh garlic uh, per pound of food fed <clears throat> once a day. Not per pound of animal, but per, per dose it on the amount of food that the animal eats. Okay, so what that <clears throat> An eighth to a quarter of a teaspoon mm-hmm. per pound of food fed. Yeah. That isn't much. <clears throat> really just put no, a pinch. <clears throat> just yeah. a pinch it's on not very top much. of their food. There is some studies, and I think, we cited them, <clears throat> I think we cited them here. You know, as we said earlier, what we're doing with it depends on how you feed it. So if you really want that, you know, antibacterial effect of the allicin, then you better have pretty freshly squeezed garlic, and it does, it's not going to sit around for a long time because it's going to oxidize out and not be very useful. It, you can't necessarily get a really high level of allicin in, um, in, a, in a garlic and olive oil you know, tincture that you, you might do or something like that. So you really need to think about what part of this plant do I want to use um, or what do I want to use it for and then think about how we deliver it. One of the things that, that we talk a little bit about in um, garlic and one of the things that happens is when, when we take things out of context is people talk a lot about Heinz body anemia and, you know, garlic and onions are poisonous to animals and, you know, we're going to have all sorts of trouble with them. Realistically, that tends to be dose dependent. It tends to be um, more in onions than in garlic. <laughs> Um, it tends to be in situations where they get in and eat a whole lot of, like a lot, a lot, not just a couple in the, you know, a couple, uh, a, a little bit in their, in their meal. Um, and, you know, some of the research that was done, for example, in horses to start saying, oh, my gosh, we're going to have Heinz body anemia in horses if we feed them garlic. They were being fed two and three and four cups of chopped garlic a day and, and starting to see that problem, which is just an absolutely, I, I think, um, you know, un, unrealistic dose. We do have the odd animal, and it usually is in cats and occasionally in dogs, and I have never yet seen it happen in ruminants or, or horses that have a real sensitivity to garlic. So just a little bit will we'll tip them over and have trouble. But by and large, it doesn't seem to be an issue. The other thing to remember when we're talking about Heinz body anemia, which is an abnormality of, 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 that happens in the red cells, um, anything, um, turnips and kale and rapeseed, canolas, that sort of thing, you, you can get the same thing with. And you very rarely see those quite hysterical warnings that we get with garlic. So it's a, it's a great it's a great uh, it's a great herb to use. Um, I put this one in just just as another um, another one to remind me. We have a couple studies talking about go back one slide or go up one slide. Calendula is a great herb. Um, you know when you talk about the what to use instead of or what do you want to have in your medicine chest instead of. I use this herb for a lot of things. I use it. Uh, internally, I mean, you can eat it in salad if you want to, but I use it internally, and I also use it for everything from eye washes to ear washes to skin knees to infusing uteruses uh, in the tincture form or in the fresh tea form. And and it's a really powerful, powerful herb. Uh, it's got really got strong antibacterial effects, uh, antifungal effects. I have no worries at all about wound infections and those kinds of things. Uh, use, you, you know, using calendula instead out of a topical antibiotic. I have no worries about uterine infections and, and that sort of stuff. If I would infuse a uterus with that, I'll dip navels with it. I've, uh, I've used it as intramammary infusions with, uh, with, uh, with some, some types of mastitis and those sorts of things. It's a really, really, um, it's a really um, 
powerful herb. They did some really nice work in, in chickens um, talking about, about using, using calendula um, as a tincture form and feeding it to chickens and looking at their response to vaccinations and also looking at their performance and weight growth records. And so what we were finding with this is some work that came out of India actually uh, uh, a couple of years ago and uh, and broiler chickens. And so what they were founding, finding is that uh, the calendula actually modulated the immune response so it wasn't as severe and it increased their rate of gain and it increased their uh, feed conversion and uh, um, between two groups of chickens that were fed. So when we start looking at all those weird things that the chicken industry feeds chickens um, and on the weird vaccinations that they get because, you know, they're really immunologically sensitive and, oh, my gosh, something might come and get them, it could be just as simple. I mean, these guys were just using a little bit of calendula tincture in their in their drinking water. And, I mean, it's incredibly cost-effective with all, all of that strange side effect stuff. So that was the that was the um, t- hello C A L E N D U L A and yeah it grows like a weed people yeah chickens and I'll tell you what that's a good reminder a lot of people will feed up because it helps uh, it helps with the egg colors as well yeah they'll eat it. But it is. You can self-sow it. Uh, it grows. It, it's pretty easy to grow. Uh, it gr- comes back every year. Uh, well, it's, it self-seeds, so it comes back every year. It doesn't come from the same plant. Um, and it's really easy. It's really easy to uh, make a tincture or an ointment or a lotion out of those, uh, out of those leaves. Uh, you can buy it commercially as well. You can buy it uh, organic and non-organic sources. How about flowers? Pardon me? How about flowers? That's what you want to use. That's the medicinal part. Is is the is the petals from the full ripe flower. I think we've got another picture of it from a different from a different angle. Yeah, you just take those flower heads off, um, and uh, and to make that, you just take, put a jar, put the flower heads in the jar, put some vodka over the top of it. Usually, is the best thing to tincture in it. I'll leave it steep to make sort of tea. You can make it like you would make regular tea, fresh flowers, water, but it's not doesn't quite extract the same medicinal effect, although it can be really effective. Uh, the other thing you can do with it, flowers, tear them up a little bit, olive oil, glug, 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 cover it up, make sure everything's underneath the olive oil, cover it up with olive oil, let it steep for a couple or three weeks, and then just put it through a strainer. And that works, that works really nicely. Uh, you can use that as a massage. That, those hard quarter daughters, uh, sometimes if you put the calendula and olive oil on the outside, uh, there's some other herbs that I might put in with that. You can actually use that as a massage as you're helping to melt, melt out with some other additional things. It's not going to cure why she had it, but you got it. Um, and, and you can also add a little beeswax to that ointment. It's, it's great. It's for, for chapped udders, uh, all, all sorts of stuff. I would not. It's one of those herbs I wouldn't be without. I use it just for so many things. Yeah, we only have we have about five minutes, so yeah, okay. we should open it up for questions. Yeah, I think. Oh, you want to talk about the eggs before you go? All right, <clears throat> I, I go around telling everybody you should have a few roaming hens that can go anywhere they want. Harvest the excess eggs in the spring, okay? Because the immunoglobins will be strongest in the spring when she first comes in to lay. But you can actually hold those back and freeze them, and they would probably be the best vaccination program for your calves. You know, along with that, along with that colostrum whey, a raw egg in that bottle for the first three or four days, phenomenal. Okay, so, you're exposing it at a low level to everything. The chicken has been exposed to everything on your farm, and I know that experts and lots of people out there say you don't want chickens and cows together. But you know what? You don't want them together when the milk inspector comes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But this is going to resolve a lot. Over the years, the old timers, I mean, my grandfather and my great grandfather, this has been a remedy for years. Calves with scours, you give them an egg. You know? That's why. It wasn't broke back then, you know, and it it fixed a whole lot of things, and it still does today. But you need a roaming hen. You can't have a caged hen and give it. You're not going to get the same effects. You'll get some, but you won't get the same effects. First veterinary procedure I ever saw as a little kid. I got to carry the lantern. Was was a, a bull with a belly ache. <clears throat> Leave that sit there for a minute. 
uh, was a bowl with a bellyache. And the vet came and came into the kitchen, mixed up whiskey, quart of cream, and four raw eggs. Drip, 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 glug, 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 down Mr. Bull. You know, I don't think I've come very far in 50 years. <laughs> you want to talk about Comfrey? Uh, we can. Let's take some questions if there's yeah. anything specific, and then we can talk. The, um, the antimicrobial values from the eggs, does that only work? No, 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 no. Antibodies. 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 All right. <clears throat> no. You, you, any species. Any species. Yeah, it don't yeah. So, so, yeah, we, we picked on cattle today, and I apologize. But, yeah, no, full, full, full diarrheas, small ruminants, uh, dogs and cats on the farm, Swine. hogs, kids, but, children. Kids, yeah, well, two-legged kids. You want it from free-roaming <laughs> hens, and you want it in the spring, when the, at the first onset of lay, okay? That's the they've highest. Been, they've been roaming around the farm all winter, picking through cow manure or whatever. So they've been exposed to everything at its highest concentration levels. So those immunoglobin deposits are going to be at their <laughs> highest levels in those first four weeks of her lay cycle, okay? okay? So you want to reserve those for future use. Then after that, start harvesting and eating and whatever. And, but, you know, and if, if push comes to shove and you either forgot or haven't done it or whatever and you had a scouring pick your species in July, I wouldn't care. I just, you go out and get an egg. Yeah. It, it still oh works. Yeah. It's way, and you're better, you know, you're better if your neighbor has eggs um, and you don't have any, you're not, it's not going to be as good as your eggs, but you know, there's going to be some commonality. But the closer to home, the better. Yeah. You can do that, too, actually, if you have buy-ins. You know, so if you're buying in stock, um, <clears throat> buying in calves that weren't born on the farm, that sort of stuff. Good there's receiving a, There's a couple things. It's a really nice sort of um, um, welcome home thing is to just right. give, them a, give them a rip of that. Some, <clears throat> some folks will do, uh, I know people who, who move in a lot of small ruminant stock, and they'll actually do rumen transplant right on day one. From, from the from the room in, of of the locals um, and, and that but but the eggs are a great welcome home. If you went with more rogue type uh, bantam <laughs> hens, which you know they're going to range further. Yeah, and wider, yeah, yeah. I mean the, the, the other more thing feral is, is the egg better. size is smaller. You can actually just give it. You know, you, you don't have to work it. And now for a calf, I would still take it out of the shell. But if you had a, like a five weight. You know, beef calf that you're bringing home. I want to see you, you get it. it. I want to see you get it down there without smashing it. But. <laughs> yeah. Guinea's fine. Firm, no problem. Same there, same mechanism. If you, are you lucky enough to know where they laid their eggs? <laughs> okay. <laughs> at then my they, house, then I, they're, then they're at, not roaming very far. <laughs> at, at my house, I had no clue where that no guinea laid her clue. eggs. No so, yeah. <laughs> Me neither. Um, but the, the more ranging birds, like the <coughs> guineas or the bantams, et cetera, are going to have a, a more density to those, you know, to those valuable constituents. Any other specific questions? Let me talk about one of my other favorite plants. Um, I've got a couple pictures over here. This is comfrey, symphytum. It's a big, rangy plant. You can use leaves or root with it. Um, it's one of the plants that I would not. Would, there it is in us in a younger uh, in a younger form. Uh, they'll they'll get big, you know. In about this, uh, the leaves, as you can see, are kind of a this this shape. They're kind of uh, they've got a like a hairiness to them, but they're not like prickly. Um, you can you can take this internally. You can use it topically. Uh, it's again antibacterial, antifungal. Uh, it's a demulcent, so it's like a smoother kind of thing. Um, and it also uh, it also will draw, and it also will reduce bone pain and increase bone healing. So it's a great thing for poulticing. Uh, it's a great thing for uh, bumps, scrapes, cuts, wounds, that kind of stuff. Uh, comfrey and calendula, if you're going to make your, your oil mixes, and then you can put them together 50-50. Uh, there is some debate, and I, I mean, I can debate it with you if you want. Some people use the, use the leaves. Some people use the root. It depends what you're ultimately going to do with it in the end. Um, it's also a really great blunt cleanser. It's also a really great liver tonic. There, it's also got a really bad name in some of the conventional literature because they think it's really poisonous to livers. One of the things that we found with comfrey, in, uh, it, it tends to be a dose-dependent thing, and the problem that folks have had with it is mostly with people who have already pre-existing liver problems and they get ripping along with it. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's an herb that I use 
I can't hardly think that there's a day goes by that I don't use this herb. And it's something that's really easy for you to grow. And, you know, so when you're scattering your calendula seeds in, you can dig a little bit of comfrey. I also find that animals will eat it. Um, I When I first moved to my little farm, which is just like three-eighths of a mile from where I used to live, I couldn't keep this in my yard. <clears throat> the deer would come in. They'd clean it out. Um, it was just a really amazing, and and in the you know it took they they ate it hard for a couple years, and then they all sort of backed off. Uh, chickens will chickens will take it. I know horses will take it. Uh, cattle will take it. You don't need to force it down them, but if you can just allow them to graze it, they'll they'll uh, they'll they'll quite take it at certain times of the year and certain needs. Great liver cleansing herb as well. We have to turn them loose. <laughs>